good things come to those who wait, and we are back. Welcome to the Clearing the Crease podcast, powered by Bodog.net. My name is James Sabalski, your host with the most man, just channeling my 80s DJ. And back with us, as usual, as always, the former Tampa Bay Lightning great, Mike Commodore, and former Avalanche legend, Andrew Raycroft. <laughs> Gentlemen, it's been a minute. Tommy, you're still a lot, man. You have had your social media game has been on fire. I want to live your life, man. You know what? I get that a lot. Thank you. First off, I get that a lot and I'm not complaining. I'll be totally honest, but man, it has been a pretty rough six weeks as far as on the body. I've been moving around. We can get into it later, but outdoor game was fun. Arizona, Carolina, Columbus, Dallas. Kiowa and Charleston. <laughs> I am exhausted. A oh, Rolling Stone World Tour. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Racer, well, thank we you. run around with it. We, we've got we've got diaper bags and hockey bags, just mewling kids from event uh, to event. And, and we just live our lives vicariously through. Uh, I do. I do. I send them texts like, hey, what's up now? What's where are we? Where what are we doing now? Please just give me a just give me three minutes of what's going on right now. It is full vicarious. Hey, we got a we got a jam packed show. We got a lot to get into over the next little bit. Jeremy Roenick, uh, one of the great goal scorers, one of the great personalities in hockey history, is going to join us in just a few minutes. Um, before we kind of dive in here, Razor, uh, back in January, you took part in the outdoor game, the Winter Classic with the Bruins. Uh, you had a chance to take part with the alumni. Tommy, you were just there with the Canes. Tell me that I I wonder. I sometimes watch it from a distance. It's been a minute since I since I've taken part in a Winter Classic and and gone to a Heritage game. Sometimes it feels like it's almost fatigue, like gimmick fatigue. You guys have been living it and breathing it in the last couple months. Does it still have the magic? Does it still resonate? Or is it maybe time to less is more? Razor, start with you. It, it does resonate where that stadium is. Uh, it, it might be a little redundant on TV, um, but where the game is actually happening in Boston, they've actually had it the most times. That They've had it the third time. It was in Fenway twice, once in Gillette. People loved it. It was a perfect day. The place, the the city talked about it all week long, and it was the game was secondary. I, I mean, there's forty five thousand people packed into Fenway. Half of them can't see the the rink, but they're there three hours early. They're taking pictures. They love it. Uh, I, I think yes, you could push it, but but at the same time, I think that regional place and Kami, you'll really be able to talk to this with Carolina having it for the first time. I think the cities that haven't had it will absolutely love it. And if you do go back to cities that have already had it, they will embrace it just as much as they did the first time. Kami? Yeah, I, I'd agree. Well, for me, that was my first time ever being to one. I never played in one. So I, it was my first experience ever with one. Um, yeah, wait, 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 uh, wait, wait. That's your first time ever being in one? In one outdoor <laughs> game. Yes, yes. I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. <laughs> yes, in, in one outdoor game. Um, you know what? I'll start with the, the only one negative. The only negative that I heard from people um, was that I guess the NHL takes over everything when they do, do these events, which makes sense. And the only complaint was the game started at like 8 30, tailgating, tailgating there started at uh, 2. And the NHL shouldn't have taken over part. They shouldn't have took, taken over the parking. Getting in there was a nightmare. Like I just jumped out of my Uber and walked a couple miles. It wasn't a big deal, but the lineups were huge. That was the only negative. Like people wanted to be in there at like two and some people kind of got screwed. But in saying that, um, I walked in not really knowing what to expect. I walked through the trees, come in there and it, it was really good. I got there at like two 30 and people were fired up. I have to give like, if you would have told me something like that would happen in Carolina, like when I was there, I'd have been like, yeah, yeah, right. That ain't <laughs> happening. But it was jammed. It just got, once people got in there, it was full. The fans were fired up. I, I actually can't say enough about the Capitals fans. There was a ton of them too. Everything went well. Um, I was down on the, like not on the ice, I guess on the field next to the ice for the siren with Eric Cole and Chad LaRose. And I, I gotta be honest, I was, when they, when those bombers, they, they had bombers fly in right before like a low flyover. I was fired up. I'm like, <laughs> man, my, my hockey game is trash right now, but I'm so fired up. I'd like to go try like one 25 second shift. Um, <laughs> but it was cool. I think everybody had a blast. 
it was really well done. I know it's a lot of work. So I, I will say I'm, I'm glad I made the trip over there. Um, it was a cool experience. Awesome. Um, okay. So it, it's not being overused based on what you guys are saying. Okay. Uh, I want to dive in. We're getting close to playoff time here. And don't forget, you can get in on the action for March Madness, MLB season, and most importantly, the road to the Stanley Cup because Bodog has you covered for all props, game lines, futures from right now all the way to the cup final and beyond, as Buzz Lightyear would say. Hey, listen, make your power play, score big with Bodog. Check out the free at Bodog CA Twitter page for details how you can get up to $500 of free cash to play with right now. All right, let's dive in here. Uh, I get, First things first, Razor, you're living it, breathing it in Boston. Can anybody stop the Bruins at this point? Like, they're on the road to history right now. Like, is there anyone out there legitimately that can stop the bees? Well, we've talked so much about Carolina this season, but them losing Svechnikov is a huge deal to that franchise, to that group, because he was the guy that put them over the top against the Bruins last year in a seven game series. And, and he was the one who knocked Lindholm out in game five. And he was the one who really put it to these guys actually game two uh he was the one who really made it difficult and, and that was the big concern for the Bruins looking ahead to the third round Carolina heavy team beat them last year without Shvechnikov that opens that path a little bit more whether it's for New Jersey whether it's for the Rangers I think it makes Carolina a little susceptible not having that guy in the lineup Tommy do you Bruins. See, what like who do you see who do you see slowing the Bruins down anybody I mean it, it has been the games that I've watched. And like I said, I, I'm not out there, but I have watched a couple of games and, and the way, you know, I watched that, uh, you know, they played Calgary and, and they just find ways to win. I mean, that Calgary game, Calgary was shot yes. them like <laughs> 60 to 20 or something. It was like something like that. And they still now, win, right? And they like, still win. Right. And I'm not saying all 60, the chances are high grade, a scoring chance. I'm not saying that, but still when you're being outshot three to one, I mean, that's pretty significant. Um, I know they've lost a couple. I, 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 and shortly, I would still say the Canes, they're pretty deep, but that injury definitely hurts. And if out West, I mean, I'm still not counting Colorado out. And I did kind of like what I'm kind of getting more and more. I'm liking the Oilers. A lot of that is that uh, Connor McDavid, he can take anybody out on his own, I think, you know, with Dry Settle and Company too. But I do think they are going to be hard to beat. If I was a Bruins fan, actually, I know they've lost a couple you know, lost a couple games for them this season recently. I I would actually, I would actually prefer to see them lose a few like right now, mm -hmm. instead of like going into the, let's say they, they set a bunch of records, which I hope they do. That's great. But I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to go through a little bit of adversity before the playoffs. Cause like the last, and I know they, they have a great team and great leadership and everything, but I think, you know, going into the playoffs, like, You've been hot since September or October. Um, and then if you run into something, it could be a little tough. But, um, yeah, they're good. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> what gets in the way of the Bruins then, uh, Razor? Like, is there anything that concerns you? Like, are they their own worst enemy? I mean, they, they've shown human signs. I mean, mm -hmm. stumble against Chicago recently. The Oilers come back in Boston from a 2 nothing deficit. They're kind of, you know, it's almost like serving notice to the league. Hey, 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 these guys, they're not perfect right? They're, they're still human after all. It, what, what concerns you, if anything? Well, what can, what's concerning is, is just the nature of the Stanley Cup playoffs. And first off, injuries. But, but second off, you're going to play Tampa Bay or Toronto in the second round. And, and the first round's always crazy. We all, it's always crazy. You've got 10 days to, make, to win four times. I don't know how any team beats the Bruins four times in 10 days. I, I don't know how that happens. But you look at the second round, you've got Tampa or you've got Toronto. And it's a ton of pressure. It's, it's a lot of heat. There's so much focus on that. And that's just two weeks into the playoffs. So you, you look at that and you say, well, they could stumble. You get one injury. Taylor Hall's been out. Nick Foligno's out. That's hurt their depth in a big way. Mm -hmm. And it, so it's not going to be a cake run. They know it's not a cake run. Patrice Bergeron, Brad Marchand, they, they're talking about it. They know how hard it's going to be. But it, I just continually go back to, even if it's Tampa, even if it's Toronto, the Rangers, Carolina, I don't know how this team loses four times in 11 days, 12 days. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm with you on that. So, okay, so from the Bruins standpoint, 
we look at the Canadian team still lingering in the playoff mix right now. You alluded to Toronto. Uh, Kami, you touched on the Oilers, and maybe this already answers it, but you know, we, we look ahead towards the playoffs. Who is the great Canadian hope this year? We're coming up on the 30th anniversary since a Canadian team last hoisted a Stanley Cup with the Montreal Canadiens in 1993. There are a lot of freaking kids right now watching this going, I wasn't born yet, right? So, I mean, you tell me, of of those teams right now, Toronto, Winnipeg, dare I say Calgary, although they're kind of continuously shooting themselves in the foot, and then the Edmonton Oilers, those are the four. Sorry, Ottawa, I don't see the map being on your side either. But who do you see standing as the great Canadian hope here on this side of the border? I'll go first since I spent yeah. some time in Canada. Um, some. Some. Yeah, <laughs> very little lately, but some. Um, I'm going to go the East. <sighs> the East is so tough. I mean, it's all tough, but it's either Toronto or Edmonton for me. I'm going to go. I think Edmonton or Toronto has a better team, but Edmonton's in the West. I, I hate to say I'll get lit up in Calgary, but oh, you're I, in big trouble. Uh, I know. Oilers, okay, and you're I'm gonna get smoked. To Toronto, you're Toronto. gonna get smoked. Toronto, the Oilers say, suck. Your, your statue, your statue outside the Saddle Dome yeah, was in jeopardy. There. Still being built, but um, yeah, I think either one of those. I'll, I'll go with. I'll switch it up. I'll go with. I'll go with Toronto. Wow. I mean, yeah, that's not the Flames. I hate to say it. The the commie cup is in big big trouble. Oh yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> well, what trouble. happened? So okay. So what happened? We're we're going to talk to David Alter uh, coming up in a, in a few minutes here. But what happened to Calgary this year? Like, it, can you just simply say Jonathan Huberdo? They bought a lemon, or Mangiapane didn't produce. Like, it seems to be a little more deep rooted than that. Yeah, I think it's been a couple of things. I think well, scoring's been hard to come by for sure. I mean, they get a lot of shots. They don't get their shooting percentage, I think, is literally last in the league. Um, so they haven't scored. I, I think they have. They might end up with a couple 20-goal scorers, you know, maybe three, maybe, depending on how this goes. So scoring's been tough. Uh, you know, I think for a little while, at least, like the goaltending hasn't been great overall. I think earlier in the year, you know, Mark's from kind of, he's been better of late, but, you know, he was letting the first shot in. But I, 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 things just haven't come together. And I did see them in Dallas. Uh, I, I was well, on my trip to Dallas there. I went out there and, and watched the game. And I was at the same hotel, so I ran into a few of them. I would say I'm a little concerned. It just doesn't really seem like anybody's having too much fun. Just And I didn't even ask any questions, you know, of the few guys that came up and some staff. And I'm, literally, I'm just like, hey, what's up? You know, I got, I'm at the hotel bar just having a drink and, and a salad. And it just seemed like everybody was kind of down. Now, I mean, they're not out of it. I think they're five points out, but they got to get hot, obviously. They, they, but I think the big thing, if you had to put one thing on it, I think they got to find a way to score some goals. Razor, how about you? Uh, who's the great Canadian hope? Edmonton. Edmonton. Uh, I like Toronto. I still think Toronto is going to give Tampa a real good run in the first. I don't see how they get through the entire Eastern Conference with their back end still um, and their goal. T- I, I still believe in Matt Murray. He's won two cups. I, I I'm going to ride the Matt Murray train all the way till it drives off the tracks in Belleville, Ontario, my hometown. But um, I'm, I'm going with Edmonton. I like at home. I like that addition. Um, I like the, the path they have in the Western conference. And how do you not like Connor McDavid? It, it, oh. He, this guy is an absolute savage. It is absolutely ridiculous how much better he is to the second best player in the world. Uh, I call me. I, I don't remember a guy that we played against that had that kind of separation. I, you have to assume you go back to Lemieux and Gretzky. These guys like like Sid was amazing at his very peak. He's still amazing, but at his very peak, he was amazing. But he had Ovi right behind him, or he had St. Louis right. But there was no separation like it is right now. McDavid's just so much better than everybody else that he can. He is the only guy who can put a team on his back in the National Hockey League. And and he might be able to win a series on his own as a forward. And it's crazy to say, I'm mind boggled to say that, but. I could see him doing that, and I, I that's why I'm putting it all on Edmonton. I like the Ekholm. I think him and Nurse can 
hold it down enough and I think they can score four or five. There's penalties called now in the playoffs. They're going to score one or two power play goals every game just because they're so determined. So I'm taking Edmonton. I don't necessarily think they're the best team in the league, but I think they could go on a run better than the other Canadian teams. It is, uh, it is fascinating to see recently Leon Dreisaitl hits 100 points and there's a nice acknowledgement. And it's like Connor McDavid was 39. there 30 points ago. Yeah. <laughs> like the second best point total in the league, the century mark. And it's like, hey, nice job. Took you long enough, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's it's phenomenal what McDavid's done. I, you know, I'm I'm gonna lean towards the path of the least resistance as well, and say the great Canadian hopes coming out of the West. I'm gonna lean on Winnipeg. I know they oh, haven't been completely oh. right for the last, you know, month to six weeks compared to the start of the season, but I do think there's a path there where Connor Hellebuck, to me, that there's your Vesna winner this year, right? That's oh. he's been the best goalie. Lena Solmark. Lena Solmark, you forgot about him. Well, I, I would, I would say, both. well, yeah, they're both fair, good. Fair enough. You're in Boston <laughs> anyway. But listen, I, I think what Hellebuck has done with the Jets, he'll get a trip to Vegas. He'll be he's, there with Kami. He's, 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 he's a nominee. He's a nominee. But I would say what Hellebuck to me, there's a devil I know. I would sooner bet on Connor Hellebuck than I would Lena Solmark right now, respectfully, as good as the mm-hmm. Bruins have been this season. And on top of that, I still see you got a guy who's having a Norris Trophy campaign with Morrissey. I like the pickup of Niederreiter. And on top of that, I do think that there's enough sandpaper. I think there's enough, there's enough offense that they can punch on through to find a way to win those hard, heavy series, one-goal games, because you got a goalie that is going to give you a fighting chance every freaking round i mean it look it's a tough matchup there's it's wide open in the west but i think the path to least resistance is in the west and i'm going to say winnipeg for me i like it seaball i like it i like it uh let's go to old takes exposed this might be a bad take exposed in a couple of weeks based on uh, based on where the jets are right (laughs) now but uh, let's go back to the fall when we were talking commie i'm looking at you on this one yeah my bad tara (laughs) sanko patrick kane additions are the Rangers still trash? Hey, I'm going to uh, let me jump in and, and, and stick with, with Kami here a little bit. Okay. Cause listen, they're the reality is they're still sixth in the conference. It's not like they, they made these deals. They haven't really meshed yet. Patty Kane finally scored the other night in Madison square garden, but you still don't know what that looks like. They were through the TD garden, the Boston garden a few weeks ago and look disjointed. Don't look connected. Um, they got, so, domi- they got dominated right, by, by Boston. I yeah. And they're, game. listen, they're going on the road first round. They're going on they're They don't have home ice advantage. They're not going to have home ice advantage probably the whole way through. So they're going to have to find a ways to win on the road. And, um, listen, they're, they might, I was kind of leaning that way that they weren't going to make the playoffs a little bit like Kami. They, they've certainly surpassed that, but I'm not sold on these deals, actually putting them over the top because I think New Jersey is a lot better than teams think. I appreciate the backup razor. Thank you. you. Tommy, you got Uh, it. I will say, you know, looking back, maybe my judgment was a little harsh. I think it was appropriate (laughs) at the time. I think calling them trash, that might've been some of the, uh, that Sunday old town talking (laughs) a a little bit of the booze. So I will back it off. Uh, They aren't trash. They're going to make the playoffs. If you make the playoffs, I can't call you trash, but I am with razor on it's. And I think we're going to, get into it. Maybe we're going to do it now, but with those big additions, the sexy additions, it's going to be interesting to see how that, those are some big names. And those are some big names with guys that have had some success, obviously, especially Patrick Kane. How are these guys going to adjust? You're coming into a pretty good team. Everything's different. Uh, You know, I've never played there, but of all teams to get traded to, you know, the city of New York, there's things are done differently as far as where you live and getting to the games and where you practice. Like there's a lot of kind of moving parts from what I've heard. So that's just, a, it's, it, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but like everything that those guys are used to, and this is the first time they've gone through it is now changing. So it'll be interesting to see like off the ice and obviously on the ice, maybe their roles are slightly different, a little bit different from what they're used to. So it'll be interesting to see how it works out. I don't, I don't fully trust the Rangers though. And, and kind of, no. you know, look, I'm not ready to go out and call them trash, but I, I do think that there's a mix there that you've got a goalie. Yes. You've got a core that went to a conference final. 
I just don't know if I see them being battle hardened to go mm-hmm. four rounds to go the distance. Razor, I see you nodding, so I'm not completely crazy on this take, but even though you've added two champions with Tarasenko and Kane, guys who know what it takes to win, I just don't know if they're heavy enough as a roster to go the distance. Well, I, yeah, like they're going to have to, if they go into Carolina, what does that matchup look like? I mean, Carolina is going to lean on them pretty good. And and what happens when the rubber really hits the road for these guys and they get down 0-2 in a series or 1-2 in a series and they haven't played with each other for a long time? Where does, what, what kind of pressure develops inside the dressing room by bringing in a Tarasenko and a Kane at the end of, of a deadline? And there's not enough pucks on the ice for everybody to shoot it. And, and and that that's that it's going to be very interesting and fascinating what that experiment because I think that's the biggest experiment of everybody at the deadline is the New York Rangers and and see if it works it could flame epically. Yeah, when you look at uh, when you when you look at some of the the acquisitions the deadlines obviously it's been a few weeks everybody's had a chance to kind of get comfortable with their new unis. Um, which teams do you think did the most favors for themselves, Kami? Which uh, which move did you like? You know what? Not to I know that I took them out of the out of Canada because I backed off the Oilers because I'm scared in Calgary. But um, <laughs> I, I I really like the Leafs. I thought they got um, you know Shen is what he. I mean, I have a soft spot for those kind of guys because it's basically what I was. I mean, it's not like he's you know real fun to watch, but you know what you get. I like that McCabe, that uh, Akari, or whatever you say his last name. Achari, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like those guys are. Those guys take the body. Those guys get in the way. And and Ryan O'Reilly, I know he's hurt right now with his finger, but I mean, I love that guy. I mean, he winning draws. He plays both ends of the ice. He can score. He's a winner also. Um, so when I saw the pickups, uh, I liked it. It's going to be interesting to watch because I think Dubas has realized, you know, from the Toronto Maple Leafs in the last couple of years, it's like, okay, yeah, it's great to have, you know, you, you need your Matthews and your Marner and your Carlson or, or Nylander, sorry. Um, you know, these high flying, I don't want to say prima donnas, that might be a little hard, but you know, he's realized and he went out and got some grit. Um, so yeah, my first reaction when I saw those trades coming in, I'm like, I kind of like that. I think that's what they need. So I'd go with the Leafs for me. Uh, Razor, I love the pickups of Boston, uh, what they did. Yeah, the acquisitions. I mean, they, they checked all the boxes, but when you look at that Leafs roster to what Kami was talking about. I mean, do the Leafs have a roster that can, you know, pull off four wins in 11 days against Boston? The the back end, I, I, and I, yeah, I, I, they hit needs. I think a lot of the teams did a really good job getting, like, crazy. nailing what they needed. You know, Tampa gets a third of their, their guy, Jano. They, mm-hmm. they pay for it, but that's exactly what they, they know they need that. Now what Toronto's done, Toronto got all the grit. A sneaky one for me is Timo Meyer to New Jersey. Mm. I think that has gotten oh, overlooked that's... in a big way. He was the best player available. Uh, he's a, plays a heavy game. He's played in a lot of playoff series out in San Jose with Joe and Patty and those guys. He knows what it takes. And he puts that team a little heavier, a little harder to play against up the middle in New Jersey. I think that was really sneaky by Tommy Fitzgerald in New Jersey. And I think it's one where we go back to the Rangers. Who's going to take out, T- like Timo Meyer is going to line up against any of those guys in New York and be able to, to put it to them. Um, so so I like that move. I, I brought up Ekholm. I, I really like that move for Edmonton. And and I, again, being a bit of a homer in Boston and seeing what's going on, Dmitry Orlov's a lot better than what everybody imagines. The guy played 24 minutes a night on a Stanley Cup winning team in Washington, and they just added him to Hampus Lindholm and Charlie McAvoy on the back end. I, I, with with Hathaway, the grit up front, Bertuzzi, more grit there for those guys. They really nailed. Donnie Sweeney really did nail what, what he thinks they need as well. So I, I, I in the East, everybody did a really nice job getting what they need to try and beat the other team. You know, I completely, I will, yeah. sorry to cut you off there, yeah. Seaball, but uh, admittedly, I have not forgotten about, but I completely forgot about that Meyer move. And New Jersey is a team that you're saying like overlooked. I I have to start watching more of their games because that's a team that I've kind of like forgotten about. And I and I do know they're really good. But that Meyer, he, 
He is good, that too. He's a good and player. He's <laughs> yeah, he's sneaky big. Yeah, yeah. I saw him a couple weeks ago down the ice. I was like, oh boy, that guy's a monster. Yeah. He is a beast out there. Oh, just massive. You know, I'll say this one of the moves I absolutely love, it's not ultimately going to probably make a difference this season, but in the long run, how about the Sens picking up Jacob Chikrin? Right, I knew like, you were going to say that. Pick up yeah. that move for a, and what it wound up being, right? For all what a disaster from Arizona! What a disaster from Arizona! Oh my like, god! What? You know, a first and two seconds. It's like, <laughs> really? Yeah, really? And 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 you know, the fit just immediately. Look, Ottawa needs a goaltender right now in a desperate way, and I obviously from a math standpoint, time is not on their side. But from a long term standpoint, boy, that move checks a lot of boxes for me. So. Um, that's, that's a good time. Um, Hey, listen, while we have a moment, um, want to jump in, uh, don't forget everybody. If you, uh, want to win yourself a free NHL Jersey, we know you love free. If you're interested in winning a free NHL Jersey, courtesy of Bodog.net, all you got to do is reply to this video, wherever you're watching it on at Bodog CA or on the Bodog YouTube or Instagram page with a question for Kami, myself, Razor, if we pick your question, you could be walking away with a free NHL jersey courtesy of Bodog. This week's winner, Cameron Kay from Medicine Hat, Alberta. So, Kami, go figure. This one's actually for both you guys. Do goalie goals still excite you guys? Razor, have you ever scored a goal? Kami, have you ever been on the ice for a goalie goal? Keep up the good work. Love the show. And surprise, surprise. Cameron says I'm in one. So, oh yeah, they like that out there, Medicine Hat. <laughs> okay, Kami, why don't you start? Have you ever been on the ice for a goalie goal? Do you still get excited for him? Uh, I have never been on the ice for one. Um, actually, I'm not even sure if I've ever been out for somebody seriously attempting it. I do still get excited watching them for sure. I never got. I mean, when the goalie was pulled, I wasn't on the ice, so that was never. <laughs> I was sitting there watching, but uh, no, I didn't get that. I know there's been a couple of them lately. I watched, uh, there was a kid in American League. He had, uh, actually, I just read him when he had a week. He scored a goal, got in a fight the next game, I think, or maybe it might have been yep. right after that because he celebrated too hard or yeah, something. Yeah, that's what it was. I yeah. looked like he was having a hell of a time. And I think he tried to start a fight the next game too. So there's been a couple of them happen, but no, I, I haven't had the pleasure. Razor? Uh, I took a rip in junior when I was in Kingston and, and just missed the net to, to my left. So the right side of the other end, um, you have to be very confident in, in uh, your, your, your score in that time. But, but I was excited. I, I actually, I saw Linus um, a couple days after when he got back from Vancouver, after he scored in Vancouver. And I, I, I said, it was the first time that I've actually been excited, like a fan excited since I finished playing, watching him do it. And I think it was a little bit was, it was a horrible game. I was working the game and it was so bad. We're like, what are we going to talk about? This is the word, you know, they're going to win two to one, but what are we doing? And then all of a sudden he scores and it was exciting and amazing. And the the degree of difficulty was off the charts from Linus. He had to go to his right, get around the puck, and he sent it so high in the air. It was so good technically that um, I was excited about that goal uh, that that Linus scored the other night. And then then the kid in the minors a couple of days later starting fights with his cellies oh, was was even better. That was great. <laughs> get that guy in the National League. <laughs> Absolutely, I love that was it. Amazing. I hope he's good. Um, uh, what a great, I mean, what a great goal to see. Um, I mean, what a year, everything coming up bases and the Bruins yeah. even get themselves a goalie goal, which was fantastic. I was, I was dropping, of course, late in the game, the game's out of hand. I'm driving, my daughter's going over to a friend's place or listen to it on the radio and then hear it. It's like, Oh, Hey, goalie goal. That's awesome. I can't wait to get, <laughs> you know, get home and, you know, why did you put it on back and, and to watch it? Because it's such a unicorn moment, but I was actually in what was then GM place now Rogers arena, what, 20 years ago when, when Nabby, when, uh, yeah. Yeah, the Bokovs uh, put one in, it was, you know, late in the game and you're kind of scrambling to get ready to go downstairs through your post-game interviews. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's in the back. Holy shit. Like, he <laughs> yeah. a goal. like that's a goalie goal, right? And it's kind of, you know, and fans are starting to filter out and it's just one of those moments that, uh, yeah, Van City's got two of them. That's probably the only place that has two. Well, I get maybe Philly with Ronnie Hextall, but maybe um, Philly. Yeah. Two visiting uh, goalies. Another thing that Canucks can hang their hats on this season. Yeah. <laughs> Honorable mention. I got to give a quick shout out to uh, Seamus Kodak, an old buddy, uh, oh, yeah. former goalie who, uh, when he was in the American League, scored a goal back in the uh, mid 2000s. And, 
you know, at that time, you know, footage is still great. I mean, I think it exists out there on YouTube or somewhere. It's kind oh, of you know, Sh- Shamel's got it somewhere for sure. Oh, oh, probably, he probably but, shows uh, everybody on this I'll phone I'll that. Never for forget, sure. he called. No, he called me that night. And he's like, "Hey, man, <laughs> I scored a fucking goal." And, <laughs> and, and, and like to see the footage, like you know, the camera doesn't even make its way over. But you know, finally, after about 15 seconds, so he's had time to celebrate. You kind of see, and he's still like just euphoric. So, um, yeah, man, goalie goals never ever get old so congratulations cameron uh hey don't forget please dm the uh at bodog ca twitter account to uh, claim your prize and don't forget get in on the action to the road to the stanley cup bodog has you covered for all props game lines futures from now until the stanley cup final and beyond make your power play score big with bodog check out the at bodog ca twitter page for details and see how you can get up to 500 dollars of free cash to play now we've got lots more still in show uh in store but i gotta yeah it's been a while since we've done this anyway david alter uh lease reporter is going to drop by in just a moment jeremy ronick the legend is going to drop by on the clearing the crease podcast as well it's all still ahead so hang around everybody get in one the clearing the crease podcast powered by bodog.net continues james sabalski andrew raycroft mike commodore and one of only 47 people in the history of the sport of hockey in the national hockey league to pot 500 or more goals and one of the great personalities in the history of the game as well jr jeremy ronick how are you man I'm great. Love being on with you guys. Two of my favorites, actually. Razor, you're, you've been a lot of fun to watch, watching a lot, watching you a lot. And of course, Kami, your hair's a little bit shorter. But Michael, I, I, I just love you so much. So it's good to be with you guys, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, you got it. You got JR, it. I got to say, you know, we talk about personalities. To this day, I, one of my favorite all-time sound bites in hockey history is you with a swollen, bloody mouth, missing mm. maybe a couple of chiclets with a just just a dramatic pause with it too. NHL, wake, wake the fuck the up. Fuck up. <laughs> well, that was a that, that was um yeah that that was one of my most probably the most angry that I've ever been in a National Hockey League game. You know, you're you're playing in the game. I'm playing in Buffalo for the Flyers. And I get I get high stuck in the first period and no call, like not even one. I go in, I get stitched up for five stitches. I come out in the end of the first period. I get high stuck again. I mean, as clear as day. And it cut the same cut. All the five stitches came out. I got another three. So now I have eight. And you're stitches. screaming on the bench, right? Well, no, not yet. I'm. St- I mean, I'm screaming at the referees because it was just. It was. I can't even believe it. Then the third period. What really got me now I have, now I have, I had five stitches. They came out. Now I have eight stitches. I'm flying around the net. And as I'm flying around the net, the defenseman tries to lift my stick and literally hits me right in the same cut <laughs> and knocks them all out again. And the, the referee is, whose name was Blaine Angus at the time, you know, that was doing the game is sitting, looking right in my eyes. I mean, I get high stuck and I catch eye to eye with him. And he sees it and he doesn't do anything almost like a fuck you to me. And I <laughs> skated, I skated by him and I'm bleeding like a stuffed pig. I'm, I skate by him and I spit blood at his feet <laughs> and, and absolutely, absolutely motherfuck him because now I'm sliced up again for the third time in the game. And I have not gotten one penalty call and I just lost my shit. He gave me, he teed me up for spitting, for spitting blood at his feet and then I get to the bench and I grab a water bottle and I remember Mark Recchi went up to him at the at the box at the penalty box he says hey you know give the kid a break he's been sliced up three times you haven't cut his bloody mess you haven't called one penalty and as he said that I threw the water bottle and it one bounced and hit Blaine Angus and Blaine Angus goes he just hit me with a water bottle and I, and Rex goes Rex goes, hey, let's get this game over with, okay? No more whistles. Let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> that, was, that, that was it. Uh, yeah. that, that, cost me, that cost me 90 grand of a suspension. For throwing oh, 90K. Bottle. 90K. Yeah. But you know, it, was, it was worth it. It was worth it. <laughs> you get sliced up three times and pissed it off. And that, yeah, but that, yeah, but that's when I got in the locker room and literally got looked like I just got, got into a fight with a with a lion. I mean, my <laughs> face was just cut up like a mother and I my lip was hanging off, my eyeball, my eyeball was hanging from another cut. 
And I just, I just let the league have it and, and to just told them that the, the referees have to be more, more responsible for how they call the games. And, you know, wake the just, fuck just, up is right. Just, just a day in the life, baby. Just a day <laughs> in the life. JR, I want to take it back to the beginning. I actually didn't know this till I was looking uh, with your many stats uh, today. So I know you're from Boston and you, you, I didn't know you played in Hull, 28 games, mm-hmm. 34 goals, 30. You, you didn't need to be there long, obviously. No. How the hell did you, <laughs> no. Up in, no, no, just dominate yeah. that league for a quick 28. How'd you end up in Hull? So I left, I left, um, I left Boston. I left high school after my junior year and I turned pro. I said, listen, I'm 18 years old. There's the best chance. I just got drafted in the first round, eighth overall. So I said, listen, I'm at school's not for me. Let's just turn pro at 18. I'm 158 pounds. And I go into the Chicago, literally soaking wet, 158 pounds. And I have a really good camp and made the team. And um, the first four games, I mean, you, when you're 18 years old, 158 pounds coming out of high school, that's a big jump. And the first four games, first four games, I didn't have a point. And Mike Keenan came up to me and says, hey, kid, listen, I could keep you here and you can battle it out or or I can send you down to my, the juniors so we can play against kids that are a little bit more your age, your size, you get a little bit more like tutelage and so, stuff like that, and play, you know, a, a higher type of game. Because Gretzky had, had drafted me uh, three years earlier. I was actually um, belonged to the Hall Olympics in the draft and, and Sault Ste. Marie in the, in the Ontario. So Keenan says, we can either send you to Hull or to the Sioux. And I said, you know what, Hull is, a, you know, it's closer to home. I love the Quebec League because of its offensive, um, it's, it's offense. And um, I said, let's go there. So they, uh, I went there and just tore that, tore that up for 28 yes, games. Did. And <laughs> yes, <you> came, did. <laughs> came back in February. You know, it's funny how I came back because I, I got hurt coming out of the World Juniors. I didn't play all of January because I had a hurt knee. And the Chicago Blackhawks had a, an emergency recall situation. They can only call up a junior if there was too many men hurt and they couldn't bring up some guys from the minors because they didn't have enough players. So they had an emergency recall. They brought me up on, on, on Valentine's Day of 1998 or 1988, 89 Valentine's Day. I actually tried to get to the airport. I T-boned the car because I ran a red light running to the <laughs> airport and, <laughs> banged into it, absolutely t-boned the car and she went off the road into the house of a of the house into the living room of the house i was what? at and the cops yeah the cops told me just get out of here jr you gotta go you gotta you got a game tomorrow get to the airport <laughs> never heard of anything that's canada for you right you that's get canada. never heard about it again <laughs> t-boned a car never hear about it again but um i scored my first goal my first goal that ne- that next night without playing one game for like like six weeks because of a knee injury in minnesota um, and I did it without a name tag on my back. I just called me up and, um, Mike Keenan, I scored three games in a row in the call up and Mike Keenan went to Mike Gapsky, who was the trainer of the Chicago Blackhawks and said, Hey, make sure the guys that are injured stay injured. We're not sending this kid back. So these guys, even though they can play, keep them injured, you know? So yeah. it was, it was pretty funny how, how I got to stay up with the team the rest of the year. You, you talk about tearing it up in Hull. You were about, I think there's about four years between the two of us, JR, but I kind of caught the very tail end, the remnants of the strip in Hull. Did you get to experience the magic of the strip? Goody so all you mean the, the strip, you mean the strip the club? club? All the nightclubs. You mean the strip, would, mean the strip club? Yeah. Well, the I mean, there, yeah, there, yeah, there, yeah, there were yeah, some there the too, but like just there was that yeah, stretch of all the bars, right? Broad <laughs> Street course. and uh, City course. Club and uh, Shalimar's. <laughs> Shalimar. Well, Shalimar was our hangout, right? So that was your spot. So it was Shalimar to Pigal, Pigal to Shalimar. Pigal. It was back and forth, and then a little bit of Putin in, in between. <laughs> but you know, these guys guys always wanted to hang out with me, not because they liked me the most, it's because I was making NHL money in juniors, so they knew I would pay the bill everywhere. I was making like thirty five thousand dollars playing juniors. Everybody was like, "Oh, we're going out with Jr." <laughs> <laughs> We're going yeah. to Pig Al's. We're going to Pig Al's. Yeah. The lap dance is on JR. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. JR, so we did, uh, we had a little Thayer Academy talk uh, a few mm-hmm. games ago. The Bruins played Chicago. So the, the JR profile was done on Nesson. Um, I saw that. I did saw you? That. Yeah. That was, that was, that was, was, that was very cool. My, my brother actually sent that to me last night, and I was really, 
really happy to see that. That made me that 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 brought a lot of warmth to my heart. So thank you for that. That's yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. No, of course. And I'm here in Boston, so there. Oh, and yeah. there's all the connections, Mots and and Jr. And there's yeah. always everyone's connected to you somehow down here. But going through the Chicago highlights, my favorite one is is '96 and Patrick. Um, Lock, the two yeah. of you going back and forth with the jock and the rafters yeah. and then the rings just walk <laughs> can you walk us through that series yeah. i mean that was prime yeah. time for me so remember i told you about my clipping in the mouth was one of the most times i was angry that that series was the other time when i was the most angry because we, we actually had a lead on colorado in the in the playoffs i think we're up two one going in, in game four and in game three, I just lit up Patrick Waugh on a breakaway and just actually burned his jock severely bad and scored a goal in the game three win. Well, game four, we go into overtime and I'm on a breakaway. I mean, clear all out breakaway. And I will tell you, this is the worst, worst non penalty call in the history of NHL hockey overtime playoff games Sandus Ozelinch pushes my feet from behind and they clear out breakaway and trips me I mean I have a breakaway and I don't even get a shot off after I just burned the shit out of Patrick Waugh in the game before and I don't even get a shot and and McCreary doesn't call a penalty I mean are you I don't know if it was McCreary or Koharski which one of the two I think it was McCreary and I'm like are you fucking shitting me they don't call a penalty and I'm complaining about it and we end up losing the game and Patrick hears me complaining about it. He says, this don't, this didn't matter if I would have saved it anyway. I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. But where was he in game three? I put him <laughs> looking for his jock up in the rafters and so on and so forth. And then he comes up with the the best line to shut me up, right? I don't tear what Jeremy Roenick say for the two Stanley Cup rings that are plugging my ear. <laughs> so... <laughs> The only thing, the only thing I can say is, hey, can you can you please tell Patrick Waugh the United States we have plurals? So if he has two, <laughs> if he has two rings plug in his ear, his other one can hear me. So shut the fuck up. Oh. And we, it? it just went back and forth. And we, I know Patrick and I had a, a very big deep respect for each other, and we played, you know, the same type of mentality game in our minds, even though different positions. And he's just one of the best competitors I've ever played against. That was one of the one of the cool parts of my career for sure. So, so to that, to that point, when you look at, I mean, you scored 500 plus goals. Um, who's the best goalie in your mind that you would have played against? To me, to me is Marty Brodeur. Uh, he really, he, he played, he played such a style cause he was a big goaltender like Patrick, but he, his, his technique was so, he, he covered the angle so well. And I think he was so disciplined in that, you know, in that, in that age, in the early nineties where Patrick and, and Brodeur, they, pretty much revolutionized the butterfly style, which for a lot of us, it, it kind of confused us, right? It wasn't the, it wasn't the Greg Millen, Grant Fuhr, you know, kick out, <laughs> hit, you know, knock it out with the stick and don't want to go on the ice because they're too out of shape. They have to pick themselves back <laughs> up, <it> right? <laughs> yeah. The, the, these are the goaltenders that actually started to get in shape, right? You know, Marty Brodeur was, was definitely more uh, was bigger, was definitely more athletic and uh, always, always drove me crazy. And I can't tell you how many times I get in front of that net and his, he just, that little stick just would come up right, <laughs> right, in the, right, right in the smoothie, right in the smoothie and knock you out for about three shifts, man. Knock you out. Yeah. You know what that's like, Razor. You know, what you, 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 yeah. it's so gutless. <laughs> yeah. It's oh, yeah. so, I, I feel so, guilty about yeah, that sometimes. I, I, I can imagine, I can imagine you just couldn't wait to get that little smoothie shot into somebody in front of that net, right? <laughs> There's a list of yeah. guys. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> JR, I want to ask you a question. I get a lot. I, I get it a lot because I roasted them online and <clears throat> it hasn't gone away since with fucking Babs. But I just want uh, one of the reasons why everybody loves you is you speak your mind and you say it how it is. Maybe yeah. give me a couple of coaches like uh, I'm not saying roast them or anything like, but a yeah. coach that you liked or and maybe one so much that, you know, that you didn't like so much. You know, I it's for for me the one coach that I, I had the, the biggest love hate relationship with was Ken Hitchcock in Philly. Um, you know, you know, when you're in a Ken, Ken Hitchcock lo locker room, it's Ken Hitchcock's team. Right. And he's one of the best coaches I've ever played for. One of the most brilliant minds that I've ever, ever played, uh, played for in terms of his hockey knowledge, his ability to work a bench, but he just complained all the time. He whined all the time. And I was one of those guys that liked to have fun. And I wasn't the guy that was, you know, that was stringent in the locker room that was, didn't smile. I always wanted to have fun. And, 
And he was like, JR, why do you always have to be on your own page? And I'm like, because my page is more fun and it's better and it's more exciting and your page is boring and you just want. So it was just one of those guys. We, we just, we, we were like sandpaper. I respected the hell out of him, but he drove me crazy. I can remember playing in the game and he's yelling at me in the game. And I literally stopped and said, will you shut the fuck up? I'm trying to play a game here. Like it's enough. I'm tired of hearing you whine. But you can't take away how great of a coach Ken Hitchcock was and what he did in the game. He, he will go down as one of the best coaches of all, of all time. Just, I just wish that he stopped. And he <laughs> wished, by the way, he wished I stopped my mouth too. So there wasn't, there wasn't enough air in the Wells Fargo arena for both of us. Yeah. I had Hitch for a, uh, for, for a year and a half or so in Columbus. And I, I same thing with, with Hitch. I always thought maybe you'll agree with this. If we could have had, if we could have had Hitch on game day during a game, if he would stay in the fucking locker room and come in in the intermission and give his little spiel, and then when everybody else goes out for the game, if he would just stay the fuck off the bench and stay in the coach's room, I don't think he ever would have got fired because all of the problems, at least when I was around, was yeah. he just got on the bench and would not shut the fuck up. You could be winning well, the game five nothing, he'd be all over somebody for like doing some minor turnover in the first period. Yeah, I remember Guy Carbono told the story when he was in Dallas the year that they won the cup. He like literally, he, he yelled at the team so much, he, he went off the bench and said, you guys do your own thing, I'm out of here. And he walked off the bench because the team wasn't, was was sucking so much. All of a sudden the team changed. Yeah. He left, Carbono came on, took over the bench and they started, they came back and now they're winning. So then Ken came back onto the bench and Guy Carbono goes, get the fuck get off the, the bench. Fuck out <laughs> <of here. laughs> get off, you're done. Get off the bench. You're not, you're not welcome here. You leave us once you're out. I thought that was like the greatest story ever. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Do you like the it. game now, JR? Do you like the way the NHL is right now? You know, I, it's a great question, Razor. Really, that's a great question. I think the game is as talented. I think what these guys can do on blades and what they can do on skates and ice, they are so, they're specimens, right? But I, I, I just think it's a, it's a boring, bland style of game. Everybody can do the same thing. Everybody can shoot. Everybody can skate. Everybody can, you know, it's, there's no physicality anymore. The fighting is kind of, is, has been drastically decreased 80% in the, in the game. Um, I am an old school type of guy. Um, I've been in, I think it's, it does not play well over TV. Um, you know, I, I, it's, it's the talent is as good as it's ever been, but how many times you see a defenseman behind the net, throw the puck from behind the net all the way up to the blue line, they tip it in and they go chase it. They go chase it. There's very little creativity left in the game. Uh, you do have your players like Zegras who are fun to watch. Obviously Connor McDavid's the best player that I think ever put on blades. He's the most talented player I've ever seen. Uh, I'm amazed at their at their agility and their and their ability to play the game. But it, to me, it's, it's just it's just not exciting. I, like I, I want to see a good fight. I want I want to see somebody get hit really hard and not have somebody come and fight just because the kid got hit hard. You know, it's part of the yeah. game. And I think what the league has tried to do to protect players from themselves, which is okay with the headshots, but these these ticky tack penalties, you, you you slash somebody in the hands, you get a penalty. Stuff that doesn't matter in the game. Um, you know, I, I just, I think they're trying really hard to increase the goals, but now that they have increased the goals, I mean, take out, take out the, the slashing on the hands penalties, the, the stupid ticky tack stuff that, 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 that you don't need. But, um, so the answer to your question, I like it, but I don't love it. Mm -hmm. Uh, listen, we really appreciate the time JR and it's, uh, you know, so gracious and love the storytelling. And I feel like we could, you know, we're just starting to peel back layers. We could go all day yeah. on this, but oh, I gotta, I gotta tell you, you know, one of, one of the, one of the, you know, I've been fortunate enough to cover a lot of cool events in my mm -hmm. lifetime. And, you know, Leaf fans are going to kill me for for bringing this up. But covering that 04 series with Philly and Toronto, I mean, yeah. you called game, hey. right? You called game with that. It's and it. what a shot. On that. What a shot. What yeah. a rocket it's my, over Eddie. It's, wow. it's my favorite. It's my favorite goal of all time. And I just, I just, I mean, it's, it was my favorite, my favorite moment because I'd never heard uh, Maple Leaf Gardens or at the time Silent, Air Canada. Silent, but it was Silent. louder. It was louder than I've ever heard it when Sammy Kapanen got hit. And by the way, Sammy Kapanen got hit by Darcy Tucker harder than anybody I've ever seen. I, I, I tell you, every player in the league right now, if they get hit like Darcy Tucker hit Sammy Kapanen, they would be out for two months. They wouldn't even yeah. come back to the come back to the ring. Sammy Kapanen gets up. He gets up. Mm. 
gets off, gets off the ice. Actually, Keith Primo had to reach out with the big, with the big hook, yeah. to hook him off the Get ice. Him in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I jump on score in overtime and um, knock them out of the playoffs. And to my, just to my love of, and I love Toronto that we're the bleed love Toronto. I love the fans, but they have not won a series since that goal. And that makes me so happy. They have the JR jinx. <laughs> that does make me happy. Yeah, eight, they beat eight, Ottawa. They beat Ottawa years. in round one. And then they lost yeah. to you guys in round two and have not won a series since that 2004. 18 playoff. years. They get, they got the JR jinx. The JR jinx. That's I so like great. that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Where can we find you? Where yeah. can we find you these days? Uh, if people want to uh, find more JR. Yeah. So I actually do a podcast with my good buddy, Andrew Peters and Craig Reve uh, after the whistle on Wednesdays. Uh, that's kind of my only, my only connection to the game. Uh, besides that, you got to come out to the golf course and play with me. And I'm going to get, I'm getting you out there, Kami, really soon. I wish you can come with me to uh, into South Carolina next month, but I'll, I'll get you out to it to a uh, pebble next year. And I'm going to pebble uh, tomorrow. So I'll let you know how it goes. I would love that. And am, am I going to see you in, uh, in Georgia the week of the masters? Are you going yes, with Drew? We'll okay. Yeah, we'll be do be we'll be there. Okay, be bro. There. I'm not playing, but I think I'm meeting you guys right after your plan, or maybe Tuesday to Friday or Wednesday to Friday. I'm Wednesday looking to forward Friday. to it. Yes. Well, listen, maybe maybe we'll skip a day at the Masters and go play Sage Valley. That'll be great. Ooh, um, yeah. Yeah, I'd like that. I've heard good things about that place from old or, George or, Brett. Or, 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 yeah, or we'll play Olympic uh, uh, um, Augusta Country Club. I got some connections there, too. Razor, yeah. get your ass out there, too, buddy. You got 100% awesome. connections, yeah. JR. I Thanks, man. It. Appreciate you coming yeah. on, dude. Thank you. Hey, any Anytime. I'd love to come on with you guys anytime. Awesome. awesome. Thanks so Thanks, much. Man. Thanks, man. The Thanks. one, the only, Jeremy Roenick, JR, joining us here on the Clearing the Crease podcast, powered by Bodog.net. The Clearing the Crease podcast continues, powered by Bodog.net. James Sabalski, Andrew Raycroft, Mike Commodore, and from the Hockey News and Sports Illustrated, basically the two magazines that were like Bibles for me as a kid. David Alter joins the show, who is uh, with the Toronto Maple Leafs on the day-to-day. David, good to see you again, man. I, I, let me play a little finish this sentence game with you, okay? okay. The Leafs will have tremendous postseason success if... They get quality game stealing goaltending. It's still the number one question for me. All the other pieces are there. I think up front they can do it. There's a lot of different reasons, but goaltending is still the one area I feel like they didn't necessarily bolster or address. It was a question going into the season, and they had a chance to kind of add a third guy uh, just in case. And they elected not to do it. I think it's their greatest liability going in. Other than that, I like everything else that they've done. What, David, what's your pulse on game one starter? Do they go Matt Murray if based on how, if, assuming everyone's healthy, then that's always the caveat with both of those guys. Um, who's game one starter in the center? Yeah, Razor, I, I don't know. I mean, right now, I would have to say based on merit, it's got to be Ilya Samsonov, but it looks like there's this push to try to get Matt Murray ramped up for the playoffs so that he could be part of that conversation. And if all things are tied at that point, then they lean to Murray just because he's the guy that they they bet on big going into the year. He's the guy they have another year of commitment to. And I think that they really want to try to get Murray to that, that previous caliber that he was. But uh, Ilya Samsonov has been the outperformer of the two. That's who I'd go with. That's who's in the lead right now. But with so many games left, it looks like Murray is the guy they're trying to push. I've noticed in the last, well, I'm pretty sure I have anyways, in the, in the couple of game Leafs games that I've seen, they've been going 11 forward, 7 D. Um, yeah. Is that something, you, first off, I would guess, I, would, I think I know the answer, but why are they doing that? And secondly, is that something you think they're going to stick to? Yeah, uh, Tommy, you know what? I think, I think they're going to stick to it for a little while just because as long as Ryan O'Reilly is out, and they don't really necessarily want to have anybody else in there. And they've got nine defensemen on their active roster right now. Uh, obviously, Connor Timmons is not going to be one of those guys who really kind of gets in. But Luke Shen's going to come back at some point this weekend. And then you've got Gustafson. And they've got so many different guys that they really kind of have to just figure out what this looks like. And it's going to be a, a jumbled mess. I don't necessarily know that 11 and 7 is going to be ideal for the playoffs. But for right now, with these games not having a lot of meaning, okay, 
like you look at everyone else, you look at Boston is starting to struggle a bit. Tampa is starting to struggle a bit. Who cares? These games are really just a kind of about figuring out what's what they have too many new guys. And I think it's still a getting to know phase with Gustafson, with Shen and to see where Timothy Lilligren is at as well. Uh, David, I was going to go right there. The the number actually in the last 10 days, the Leafs, the Bruins and the Lightning are eight, nine and two, uh, three of the yeah. best teams in the league. They're eight, nine and two. And I was looking it up really is is it is it the same sense here in Boston? Is it the same sense in Toronto? It's just all right. What's game one? And can do who has to ramp up more for game one? The Leafs or Tampa Bay? That's a good question. I, I think Tampa needs to ramp up more just because their stars really haven't been getting it done. Austin Matthews is now on a goal streak, and their their core four forwards are are starting to light the lamp. So. You know, earlier in the year or at different stretches when the big guys weren't getting it done, that was the concern. And you can kind of point to, well, the goaltending and the defense and all this other defensive identity stuff where Tampa's kind of going opposite. It looks like they're kind of regressing from that cup final and two-time cup champion caliber team where they're ramping up and up and up. And, it, you know, you don't get usually see three top guys getting benched for a whole period in Toronto, that certainly doesn't happen. I think Martyr <laughs> at most got benched for a shift. And so, so like, yeah, it's one happening. of those things where, right, right. It's just not happening. And I think it's with the Leafs. It's just, I think the Leafs are fine in terms of the lapses and just kind of figuring out, like they have more of the excuse. The star players not performing in Tampa right now is more of a concern in that market because I feel like they have, more of a fatigue kind of setting in where Toronto's big guys are now starting to ramp up and looking like they're, they're at that point. They just kind of have to figure out how to play better collectively defensively with all these other new guys that have come in. We got about a minute here, Dave, uh, but I'm curious what, what defines success in the playoffs? Like can you run it back with everything with status quo if they win one round and then fall to say Boston in round two? Uh, I mean, you know, there's no shame in losing to Tampa in this, you know, in the playoffs, but like what quantifies success? Is there, is there a ballpark to gauge that? It, it's tough. You know why? And I go back, I was in 20, I was at that, that playoffs in 2013 with the Leafs and Bruins. And, you know, they were down, they were game down seven. three, one, they were down three, one. And everyone forgets that they kind of stole games five and six going into that, that it really should have been over in five. And I thought to myself, you know what, no matter what happens, you know, this was a good playoff series for the Leafs. <laughs> They're playing with house money. Not yeah. like I, that's what that's what people will remember. And surely enough, they had a historic collapse. So you know, the Leafs could very well get around. They could, they, they, but then they could get swept embarrassingly in the opening in this in the second round, and that wouldn't necessarily sit well either. I think getting past the first round will be the baseline for success, and then it's just a matter of the style in which they go out that will really be uh the the layers in terms of what the Leafs can build upon david thanks for this really appreciate it yeah. and it's going to be fascinating to see how this all plays out in the next few weeks um take care great to catch up david alter you can find where can we find you on social media dave yeah at Dalter on the twitter david alter 35 on instagram and tiktok there you go awesome. you can find him uh, from the hockey news and sports illustrated the one the only david alter here on the clearing the crease podcast what a great episode. Thanks so much for hanging out with us here on the latest edition of the Clearing the Crease podcast. He is Andrew Raycroft. He is Mike Commodore. Boys, the action fast and furious, man. I mean, this stretch run is going to be a blast. Wouldn't you say, guys? Couldn't agree more. It's going to be electric. A lot of fun hanging with you guys for the next few months. Oh, warm buzz. <laughs> yeah. uh, wow. Hey, Call me anyways. <laughs> Call me anyways. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and a reminder, everybody, don't forget, you can get in on all the action on the road to the Stanley Cup. Bodog.net has you covered for all props, game lines, futures from now until the Stanley Cup final and beyond. Make your power play. Score big with Bodog. Check out the at Bodog CA Twitter page for details on how you can get $500 of free cash, free cash to play with now. In the meantime, and in between time, I'm Sabalski. He's Razor. He's Kami. And we'll see you next time on the Clearing the Crease podcast, powered by Bodog.net.